Good afternoon, and welcome to my open presentation, my open lecture at the Swedish School of Sport and Health Sciences. Uh, my name is Tony Arndt. I'm professor in sports science at the Swedish School of Sport and Health Sciences, specializing in biomechanics. The title of my presentation today is Performance Enhancing Shoes. Are they cheating? World Athletics Rules and Biomechanics. In autumn, in October 2019, Elliot Kipchoge ran a marathon distance in under two hours, which had never been done before. And this was a performance that was largely and previously regarded as impossible. He was running in a pair of Nike AlphaFly Next Percent shoes. Just a quick summary of what I'll be talking about. Large international sports shoe companies, basically led by Nike, have in recent years developed fantastically innovative running shoes, which have been scientifically shown to improve performance. And these studies have been produced not only by Nike, but also by independent scientists, all showing similar results that these shoes actually improve running performance and improve running economy. The Olympic Games in Rio de Janeiro in 2016, running distances from 10,000 meters to the marathon have been dominated by runners wearing such shoes. And the International Governing Federation of Athletics, which is called World Athletics, now has a dilemma in regulating these shoes. But how? Is it cheating to run in them? And which shoes should be accepted? These are some aspects I'll be talking about today. I'll present some of the thoughts behind such a regulation and some of the work conducted in the process. Earlier today in Vienna, Austria, Eliud Kipchoge ran only part of the whole event where there was any concern was around the halfway point where he fell off pace by a fraction. So he's kind of falling off a little bit. Um, I, it'll be interesting to see. Um, hopefully he tucks right back in there with Matt. But really, there was no drama here. He sped up towards the end. His stride, perfect, always. His pace, relentless. What you could see there was the under two hour marathon distance run by Elliot Kopchogi. Uh, as you can see, or as you can maybe imagine, this was not an official marathon. Uh, he ran this by himself, but he actually had up to 17 people running with him. And you probably saw they were all wearing the same shoes. Uh, the Complete work around this two hour marathon was fantastic. It was, he had nutritionists, there was work for over a year just aiming at this. But one of the very substantial components of being able to succeed was definitely the shoes. If you look at the evolution of the top 20 male and female seasonal bests from 2012 until 2019, you can see distinct improvements in the times in all of the distances from 10 kilometers, half marathon and marathon, uh, both in the men and female events. And these have been especially prominent since 2018. Uh, the distance, the time changes in seconds maybe are not extreme, but if you think of these in terms of world records, then they are quite, quite amazing. And it's even more, pronounced in the, in the female events. Uh, it has been proposed that any such improvement, if it was not due to the shoes, must have been due to some other, possibly doping that has been occurring since then, which uh, with the very, very strict doping rules that are in place at the moment is quite unlikely. But it also coincides exactly with when the new running, the 
new running shoe technology, the advanced footwear technology was introduced. So what are these shoes? A uh, bit of a concentration on Nike today, but I'll just say right from the start that other companies are also producing such shoes now, uh, and it is not only Nike that has this advanced footwear technology. This is what one of the Vaporfly shoes looks like. And basically the advanced footwear technology is what you can see on the right hand side, uh, regardless of whether of what brand it is. What you can see is a, uh, a shoe which has been exploded. Uh, at the bottom, you can see just the outer sole, which is what you grip the ground with, uh, which is just a, a rubber component. Then the next step up is the thick midsole, which is definitely a part of this advanced footwear footwear technology. The other part is the next green layer, which is the carbon fiber or very, very stiff plate, which has been inserted into the midsole. Then you have the rest of the midsole and then the shoe upper on the top. So some components there, basically the midsole and the carbon fiber plate, which I'll be going into a bit more, which compose these shoes that have this advanced footwear technology. So, Due to the carbon fiber plate in the shoe, uh, we have a longer lever arm about the ankle joint. Uh, when you roll over during a step, you will have a longer lever arm to the ankle joint, which gives you, in a way, a bigger gear, which means if you have the strength in mainly your calf muscles, you can actually run faster after, with each step. The other component was the thick sole, which includes more energy returning material. By having a thicker sole, you can include more of this material. And the actual material itself is also new. Uh, all the companies are producing new materials which actually return energy. And the theory behind that is that during sole compression, when you're running, energy is stored in the sole compression during the loading, that is when you touch down and early starts, and can ideally be stored and released during unloading. If the timing and the material is correct, you can store energy during landing and then have it return during takeoff. So the foam would act as a spring and release energy during unloading. Then we have the carbon fiber plate inserted in the midsole. You can't see it here, but if you explode a dish tree, you would see that inside the midsole there is also a stiff carbon plate. And this provides for a stiffer metatarsophalangeal joint across the toe joint. Just an explanation here. Uh, looking at bending of the forefoot, the metatarsophalangeal joint, MP MTP, is seen on the left-hand picture between the toes and the midfoot. And this is flexed or bent during mid-stance and then straightened out or extended in late stance when you are running. By having a carbon fiber plate covering this or being underneath but across this joint, uh, you can return more energy to the runner in the late stance. So that's some of the basics behind the advanced footwear technology. There was some pretty big excitement, uh, more or less a year ago, beginning of 2000, end of 2019, what was going to happen with these shoes. Here's one big exclamation mark <laughs> of, a, of a newspaper article, controversial Nike Vaporfly running shoe used by Brigitte Cosco to smash Paula Radcliffe's marathon record is said to be banned because of the foam and carbon fiber sole plate in the shoe. Uh, that, that never happened. The shoe wasn't banned, but you can see, see that there was a lot of excitement. There was a lot of nervousness, uncertainty about what was going to happen to these shoes. And a lot of articles like this one showing the advantage that can be gained by these advanced technology issues. So what are the rules? Well, from also about a year ago, uh, we drafted these rules in January to April last year, but they actually came into place in July 28th, 2020. Uh, the distance running shoes, for example, for a marathon, are allowed to have maximum 40 millimeter soles at two positions in the shoe. One at 12% of the inner length from the back of the shoe 
and the other at 75%. So one underneath the heel, one underneath the forefoot. There are two places where they can be measured and they're not allowed to exceed uh, 40 millimeters at these positions. And the carbon fiber plates are allowed, but there is not allowed to be more than one plate overlapping each other in the midsole, which means sometimes that the shoes need to be dissected or cut up to see how the plate or plates are configured. This means that uh, the people that are running in these shoes, when they're running in any of the bigger marathons now, the people on the podium, both men and women on the podium, the shoes are collected and sent here to GIH, to the Swedish School of Sport and Health Sciences, where I have a look at them to see if they are complying with the world athletic rules at present. Uh, so there's a whole pile of cartons there. This is, for example, from the London Marathon on the top there where I have the shoes here to, to see how, how well they comply with the rules. And I am allowed to, if necessary, to cut them up, as you can see one shoe on the top right hand side there, to see how the carbon fiber plates or other material plates in the shoe are aligned. Uh, so th this is pretty exciting, getting these shoes and actually being able to see that they do comply with world athletic rules at present. Because of all of these screaming headlines and the uncertainty that arose when these shoes started becoming commonly used in the elite groups, World Athletic had to do something. So they started a working group on athletic shoes. Uh, within this working group, there's three different what they call work streams, one of which is the science and medicine work stream, uh, which is one that I'll, the work from which I will be talking about today. Uh, there's also one on certification and control of the shoes, which is an extremely complicated area, and the development and manufacturing work stream, which is looking more at the what the company's timelines are in producing such shoes. But like I said, what I'll be talking about today is the science and medicine work stream. Uh, the working group is made up of the uh, World Federation of Sporting Goods Industry, so people aligned with the companies. There's one representative from the World Athletics Council, from the, the, the top board of World Athletics. But then interestingly also, we have six representatives from the manufacturers. So Adidas, Essex, Brooks, New Balance, Nike and Puma all represented. Uh, we have one person from the Athletic Commission and then we have a lead representative from each of the work streams. And as I mentioned, the medicine and science work stream, I am the, the representative of this work stream in the working group. And we also have the World Athletic CEO, John Ridgen, who is the convener of the group. As I mentioned, it's not only Nike anymore. Nike on the top left hand corner, we have the Alpha Fly shoe, which was the, the shoe that came after the Vapor Fly, which is maybe most known at the moment. But on the right, we have an, another company, in this case, Sketches, and we also have seen Adidas, which instead of a uh, solid carbon fiber plate, they have a new technology with five rods of a stiff material in the midsole, as you can see here in the blue on the bottom left hand corner. A master's student at GIH. Frida Williamson last year wrote a uh, master's thesis on technological developments in sports, a question of fairness and integrity, uh, looking at the ethical and fairness aspects of sports technology. A lot of it was on, on advanced footwear technology and these shoes, but also looking at other sports. She wrote that to facilitate evaluation of new technology and prevent negative consequences for athletes and manufacturers, and most importantly, a clearly defined limit of allowed performance enhancement from the technology should be provided by the Federation. This is putting some of the onus, some of the uh, responsibility onto World Athletics that it's up to them to provide a limit of allowed performance enhancement. 
Transparency and communication between manufacturers and federations during the development of sports technology is recommended as a means to protect the athlete's right to participate in fair sports. So firstly, that the athlete has a right to participate in fair sports, but also that to, to facilitate this, the governing federation, in this case, World Athletics, needs to make rules to limit the performance enhancement. But as Frida was writing, it's not only shoes. Uh, there's also other examples of technical advancements uh, that, that have greatly improved sports performance. For example, in para sports, you might know Marcus Rehm, who is very, very close to breaking a world record despite having one leg amputated. Absolutely incredible performances. Uh, and as you more than likely saw, his takeoff is from the, from the amputated side, where he has a prosthesis with extreme energy return characteristics. And the question is whether he should even be allowed to compete against able-bodied athletes, not because he has a disadvantage, but the other way around, because he has a greater advantage, because he's allowed to use a prosthesis, which can be developed and developed and developed even more. Uh, and provide more and more advantage. Another example, I'll go into a slight difference in this example in a minute, but uh, just putting a bit of Swedish flavor on it. This is Armand de Plantis breaking the world record in pole vault. I hope. Six meters, <laughs> set a meeting record. This will be a world outdoor record, unofficial world outdoor record, because there is no such thing according to the world governing body. Oh, yes! Oh, oh, oh. That is the highest vault in history outdoors. The camaraderie amongst these men, you have to... Okay, and th this is a fascinating one, because obviously the pole in pole vault is extremely important. I mean, you won't be able to jump high without a pole that's got some characteristics that uh, absorbs the energy, returns the energy, bends the right amount, is stiff in the right places, is flexible in other places. Uh, interestingly enough, it's the one athletic uh, material or component or device that is not governed by world athletics. So at the moment, anyone is allowed to use any pole vault they want to. Uh, and I have no doubt that Armand de Plantis has the best pole vault makers in the world helping him. Uh, but here, there is no regulation. Um, I would like to make a difference here, though, because I regard, talking about the fairness of having these shoes, I regard it a difference in what Armand de Plantis uses as a pole compared to what any elite long distance runner uses as shoes. Because running, you can do without shoes. You can run barefoot uh, and you should not be able to have a greater advantage by wearing shoes because there is already something there that's not your training, it's not your biomechanics, it's not your physiology or genetics or anatomy. It's something else that's contributing to your performance. Pole vault is different. In pole vault, you cannot jump without a pole. So I, this is a personal opinion, I feel that in sports like pole vault where you need a technical device, the development and innovation within that device is actually an exciting part of the sport. A comparison can be also be skiing, cross-country skiing or alpine skiing. You cannot do those without the skis. So development of the sports, I think, can also be a development of the skis. Uh, whereas swimming, for example, these swimsuits that were banned in 2010, I think it was, it's the same thing there. You can swim basically without a swimsuit. And that's how fast you should be able to go. Um, 
Uh, of course, people want to wear a split swimsuit, and that's obvious. But the swimsuit itself should not be able to give an unfair advantage and make you go faster than you can without one. And that's how I see running as well. Running should be the runner showing how fast they can run. It should not be faster due to the shoes. Anyway, so back to these performance enhancing shoes. Another exploded diagram on the right hand side with the lightweight upper, the full length carbon plate, this time in red, and the material in the outer sole. Uh, in, the, in Nike, this material is called Zoomex. So, with all of this uncertainty and this working group that's been uh, constructed, built up around the, the problem, uh, World Athletics needs to come up with a protocol for testing shoe performance enhancing effects. This is something that they approached me about. And at GIH, we do not have the technical uh, laboratories that we have at our neighbors, uh, KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology. And I'm very thankful to the assistance from Lady Gutierrez Farowick and Stefan Hallström at KTH helping with this protocol. What do the rules actually say? There's a technical rule, number 143, and it says that athletes may compete barefoot or with footwear on one or both feet. That, that's a very simple thing. You can actually compete whatever you like barefoot as well in athletics. The purpose of the shoes for competition is to give protection and stability to the feet and a firm grip on the ground. They must not give athletes an, any unfair advantage, sorry, assistance or advantage. Any type of shoe must be reasonably available, but all in the spirit of universality of athletics. But most importantly, the red part in the middle there, they must not give athletes any unfair assistance or advantage. It, and that's still, that's still in the rules at present, even though we had those new rules from July last year. So there was a lot of talk about the energy return materials and about the carbon fiber plate. And the obvious question is why don't World Athletics just ban them? Get rid of this advanced footwear technology. Uh, the problem there is that if we did that, when I say we are quite often mean World Athletics in this case, uh, the companies are so innovative and of course they've realize how exciting this is and what advantages their runners can get and they would they would come up with something else uh, there, there's no doubt about that so from my point of view and i introduced this idea for world athletics it is not relevant how the sole or carbon fiber plate are constructed or aligned it doesn't matter what the shoe looks like what it's made of how thick it is uh, what's in there uh, the important thing is what the shoe actually does and the performance enhancement, sorry, mistaken the slide there, is achieved through the energy return. And what we want to test then is what the shoe does in terms of energy return, regardless of what it looks like. So not looking at whether there's a plate inside, we can test it and see what energy it returns and look at that instead. One of the issues here is that the, the studies that I mentioned that have been done showing performance enhancement, they've been done by runners, and one has looked at the running economy of the runners wearing different shoes and seen that with these new shoes, their running economy is improved. The problem there is that it's different for different people. Uh, in a, the Nike Vaporfly was called Vaporfly 4%. And the reason for that is that on average, the runners had 4% increased or improved uh, running econ economics. But the range was from one to six percent so it's actually quite a big difference between the runners and if we wanted to do some tests by having runners we would always have this quite large distribution of results so to get rid of that we're going to test the shoes without the runners and we're going to remove the bio the person from the biomechanics and only have the mechanics uh, very central to this is a test for the energy return, and you can see a quick picture on the bottom, which I'll go into a bit more detail here. Uh, the energy 
or also could also be called work, is the area under the force versus position curve. And you have one of these force position diagrams on the bottom left. Uh, and if you load a material, you get a curve going where the loading arrow is pointing, the top curve going up. And then when you remove the load, there will be an unloading and you'll get a curve shown by the darker unloading arrow beneath. As you can see, these two curves are not completely above it, on top of each other. Uh, there is a space in between. And during the loading curve on the right-hand side, you can see that is what we call energy stored. And what happens on the unloading is the energy that's returned. Because there is such a big space between these two, there is quite a lot of energy lost in this case. So it's quite an inefficient material. Uh, so it's this difference between the energy stored and energy returned that we are interested in, but also at the bottom curve on the right hand side, the energy return by itself. Because if you imagine this graph on the left being further to the, even further to the left in the graph, uh, the energy returned, the absolute energy return would actually be quite big, even if it had lost quite a lot from the energy stored. So what we're thinking of, uh, as a protocol for testing shoes for compliance are uh, compression tests where we can, with a materials testing machine, which you can see in the black uh, pusher on the top there, they, they push down onto the forefoot, loading it at a certain velocity, and then unloading it again. And we, at the same time, measure with a force sensor in the materials testing machine what the force position data will look like. Uh, we propose that this is at the forefoot at this 75% position, which I mentioned earlier, but also at the heel at the 12% position from the, from the back of the foot. Uh, once again, the plunger, the materials testing machine, pushes down on the heel, uh, then, then releases again, pushes up, and from that we get the force position curves for both the loading and unloading phase, as you saw on the previous graph. We also propose a tensile bending test and a reverse recoil test. But at this stage, I feel uncomfortable presenting these because these are still uh, confidential and World Athletics, I'm pretty sure, do not really want these tests to really be presented to, to the broad public. We are talking about them in the working group and about to present our report to the council. Uh, but before the rules are actually in place, I think it's uh, not, not too productive if I present the actual tests that are being done here. So, so if we look at this compression test, here you can see on the right-hand side what it looks like when it is actually compressed. So on the left, uh, we have the shoe in an uncompressed state. Then the plunger has been pushed down on the right-hand side for the loading. And just after that, we have the unloading where the unloading curve is presented. If we have one, two, three, four, five, six different shoes, uh, you can see that these curves are different. Both that they move from the left to the right in the, in the, on the axes, but also that the areas underneath the curves are different for the different shoes. And what we, what we can then present is for the six different shoes, we have energy uh, for the loading, which is a positive, and then the unloading, which is the energy return on the negative side, the empty boxes. And you can see these are different between the different shoes. The absolute energy return is just what's the negative values. So we, that's already a useful measurement. How much energy does this shoe actually return? But also of interest is the relative energy return, which is the ratio between the positive and negative values. How much of what was put into the shoe is also regained out of it during unloading. So these are the curves that we have for all of the shoes that we are testing now uh, at KTH. Just some things that we had to do to make sure that these tests were also usable. Uh, what's important here is that 
different laboratories around the world and maybe the manufacturers themselves will have to be able to do these tests in future to be able to themselves say that the shoes are okay or not okay. And to do this, we have to make them extremely reproducible. One effect that we've thought may be relevant is the effect of temperature. If we can't test the shoes in the same temperature in different locations, then there will be differences in the data. So we tested a few different shoes in a few different temperatures. Uh, in this case, we had a room temperature and also a minus, I think it was minus 20 degrees, we, um, just in a freezer, we just had the shoes in a freezer. And both shoes were obviously stiffer when they were frozen than in room temperature, but the temperature aspect should be considered in test standards because of this. Um, there is an effect in this extreme case when we had the frozen shoes, but the effect shows that the test should be conducted in laboratories where we can have plus minus 23 degrees, at least we said, uh, to make sure that they can be standardized in different places. Uh, in the tensile bending, for example, we also had to test uh, a certain pre-compression that the shoe required, and we tested at different forces, that's in newtons. We had 800 newtons in the left hand and 2,000 newtons on the right hand one. And we decided that we should determine pre-compression at which stiffness is stable and decided that the left hand curve was more appropriate because it, did, it removed this uh, exponential stiffness, which could be seen on the right hand side in some of the shoes. And once again, in the tensile bending, then we could see the the absolute energy return and the relative energy return on the right hand side uh, with the positive and negative bars. And we saw that plate equipped shoes generally return a higher percent of energy uh, in the tensile bending test. Okay, so what's happening at the moment is that we have from the companies, but also with our own purchases, a set of shoes uh, coming up to about 60 shoes different models uh, with quite a spectrum, which have been tested with these compression tests and the tensile bending test and the reverse recoil test to see what the absolute and relative energy returns are. Uh, we are composing data on this and a, writing a report, which is to be presented to World Athletics uh, with a complete range of these energy returns that the different shoes are providing. The plan then is that from this, these data, a threshold has to be decided above which the energy return is too great and the shoes are not compliant. And this is a difficult bit. So the biggest challenge, in my opinion, and also in, in the discussions when we are talking with the shoe manufacturers, is to decide a threshold for energy return that is compliant or not compliant with the rules. Uh, which shoes should be allowed? At what stage are they providing an unfair advantage? This is, this is a, often almost a philosophical question. If you imagine the whole spectrum, what one could do is say, no energy return greater than running barefoot should be allowed. So basically maybe minimalistic shoes, which hardly have an outer sole at all, or sorry, a mid sole at all could be allowed, uh, but definitely not anything above that. The other extreme would be to say, everything should be allowed up to 100% energy return. The companies haven't even got there yet. They haven't been innovative enough to get 100% energy return, but maybe that should be decided. Or we go in between and say shoes from 30 years ago are okay, but not anything after that. Or we could say another sort of in-between one would be anything that's on the market today is okay. That should be allowed, but they're not allowed to go above what that. So this, as you can imagine, there are extremely interesting and controversial questions and issues in this decision on the threshold for energy return. And that's the ultimate responsibility of world athletics to, to decide upon one. Also, if everyone's wearing the same shoes, isn't that fair? Good question. Uh, but there's some issues here. Uh, are the same shoes available for everybody? Uh, should uh, for, for a few years it was only Nike runners that were on the podium now luckily and very very good
good for the sport is that there's also ASICs and Adidas are, are on our podium just as much. Uh, but also, as I mentioned, there's different advantages of different runners. Uh, there was a range from 1% to 6% in the running economy difference. And where does this come from? Who knows which runners should have which shoes on? So there's already an inherent disadvantage, uh, unfairness there, that, that we don't know at present what characteristics of runners make them get better at performance enhancement than others. Another aspect is the, I guess, the economic power of the shoe companies makes it extremely important that we have a transparent dialogue with them. It takes a time for a company to produce a new prototype and then introduce a shoe onto the market. And World Athletics has to take this into consideration when proposing new rules. Uh, if new rules mean that all the shoes on the market at the moment can't be used anymore then companies need time to be able to introduce new shoes. Uh, and this transparent dialogue, I find, is one of the most important aspects of this complete process, that we, together with the shoe companies, come up with what could be a, a reasonable and relevant threshold for energy return. World Athletics is only responsible for elite sports. Uh, they are responsible for what happens at the Olympics, at the World Championships, the big marathons, London, Berlin, New York, Tokyo, and so on. And obviously any, uh, the half marathon World Championship recently, the European Championships indoor, which were over the weekend now. Uh, they're, they're responsible for a few of world, world athletics. But what happens, for example, in the Stockholm Marathon, where there's, I'm not quite sure how many, say 20,000 people running, and only about 100 of them are actually elite. How are the rules applied then? Does everyone that runs Stockholm Marathon have to run in shoes that are compliant, or is it only the elite? Uh, of course, the answer there is that it's only the elite. But where do you, how do you, how do you define that, and where do you draw the line? Uh, an extreme situation here could be, for example, that if the, if the elite have to wear shoes that are strongly regulated, then some recreational or very, very good recreational runners might actually start running faster than the elite because they are allowed to wear other shoes. So it, this is a very, uh, almost a philosophical and ethical question on how to define these things. So the new world ethics rules based upon the testing protocol, protocol developed at GIH and KTH together is going to be implemented after the Olympic games in Tokyo 2021. That's been decided. It probably won't be too soon after the Olympics, uh, because as mentioned, the companies need a timeline to be able to implement and introduce new shoes. Uh, but the prognosis is that during 2021, these new rules based upon energy return discussed here today uh, will be implemented by World Athletics. And this has been of quite some interest to the Swedish media, as you can see, with some of the newspaper clippings on, on my office floor at the bottom there. And just as a little uh, to finish off with, as I mentioned, the, the athletes in the bigger marathons at the moment are sending their shoes to DAH to be tested with the rules as they are at the moment, with the 40 millimeters and the carbon fiber plate alignment. But also spike shoes uh, have some rules, which I haven't gone into at all today, but also dependent upon their alignment of the carbon fiber plates and their heights. And I just the other day got these shoes from Sergei Gadaf, uh, who two weeks ago broke the world record in indoor 1500 meters. So immediately after she broke that record, the shoes had to be sent here so that I could have a look at them and ensure that they comply with the rules. So this is extremely relevant, it's extremely hot topic uh, and highly, highly exciting. I think it's really, really cool working with this. And I think it's fantastic for both GIH and KTH, but also for Sweden to be involved in such, a, such an important work uh, governing the athletics around the whole world. All of the major competitions are being going to be governed by what, what we are doing at the moment. So thank you very much for your attention and 
Unfortunately, in this format, we can't have any questions. I would have loved to have had a discussion with you, uh, but maybe another time, or maybe you can write to GIH and ask any questions and I'll see what I can do to answer them. Thank you.